Hello and welcome to Beyond the Bio. Today I'm joined by Lisa Johnson. Lisa has such an interesting story which does come out in this episode from having a city job to starting her first business and to moving through to her brilliant new business, that Strategy Co. Lisa talks to us about her visibility strategy, all the different things that she's doing to raise her profile and how to handle it when that raising of the profile attracts some haters so this is a fantastic episode full of lots of learns let's get stuck in so Lisa great to have you on I just wanted to give everyone a bit of context as to how we actually met because it relates to networking which is something that I think is a key part of raising your profile so we met it was a good few months ago now but definitely at some point this year in London. So I was meeting my friend Emma for a drink, who was meeting Danny, who was also a mutual friend of ours. And you were staying with Danny, I think. And we all met for drinks in Nobu, which sounds very glamorous and exciting. (laughs) Of course it was. But we were actually there because we were all invited to a dinner that the Great British Entrepreneur Awards were hosting with Boodles at Homegrown. So again, sounds very glamorous and exciting. And actually, I remember trying on million pound rings on that night so it definitely was glamorous but I think this is a great example of saying yes to opportunities and networking and how that can lead to fantastic connections and I really enjoyed meeting you and since learning more about your story so you've gone from a city job to a wedding planning business to a consultancy which has then taken off big time at the point where you've worked out how to scale it and obviously now you're showing other people how they can do this in their business so I'm sure we're going to talk about your story in our chat but as you know beyond the bio it's all about what people can do to become more visible in their industry now normally I would focus on one key element of profile building but with you I think your whole story is just so super interesting for our listeners so let's go back in time to when you had your first business so quitting the city job and setting up the wedding planning business how visible were you in that first one not that visible and actually I didn't quit my city job the whole time I had the wedding business I was still in my nine to five oh, I did it on the side And well, yeah, Um, and juggled twins who were four at the same time. So it was a crazy time for me, but I wasn't that visible. And I think that, you know, when I first started that business, I didn't really understand business at all. And so I didn't understand the need to be visible. And it was only once I started learning about business and visibility that it started to actually work and start making a profit. Wow. And you obviously got into it big time and it it really, really worked out for you. But then you moved from the wedding industry through into the consultancy and and into what you've got now. So did your approach to being visible change between different industries? Massively. So in the wedding industry, people are going to get married and there are going to be lots of people for them to choose from. And your only visibility really is knowing your ideal client because there are so many different types. Once I started this business, the business that I'm in now that I've been in for six years, visibility becomes the only thing that matters. 80% of what I do on a day-to-day basis now is visibility. Wow. 20% is delivery. Because it's a it's a personal brand business. And although I've just opened a new part of the business, which is a not a personal brand business, in the main, the, the way that I've got to where I've got now is through being visible in all different ways, you know, whether that's having a a Sunday Times bestseller, whether it's having a number one UK podcast, it's always been about that visibility that has got me the opportunities that I've wanted to have. You've done so many things. Of all of those different strategies and activities that you've done, what would you say have been the, the key ones that have had the most impact on your business? I actually think that you really need a multi-layered visibility strategy. And I think most people ask that question, like, what is the one thing that there isn't? And I think one thing alone never works. Like I see so many people just doing social media and that's their visibility strategy. And actually having a multi-layered strategy for 90 days at a time, you do three different things that are about visibility and you see which brings you the most people and then evaluate it at the end of 90 days and either keep some or change some has really worked for me. So, you know, at certain times, 
when we've looked at how many new people, new leads it's brought into us, it could be just that I'm on lots of different people's podcasts, or it could be that I'm on one certain stage that has, you know, has a lot of my ideal client in it. At other times, it's me having my own book on my own podcast. So it completely depends on what season of the business I've been in as to what's worked well. Like if you think back to that first year, and in the first year we did really well, you know, we had a multi six figure year in our first year. And the way that happened was all I did, I didn't have an email list or any of those kind of things that people tell you to have. I had a Facebook group that I went live in every single day for six months. And that's all I did. And that's what got me it. So like just going live continuously. It's so interesting to hear that advice around it's not just one thing, it's it's all, all of the different things because I think that something that I've noticed this last year is people really going on about social media and yes, we've, we've got to have a presence on social media but my worry around just focusing on that is that it's temporary. So you might do an amazing post that gets loads of engagement and loads of visibility, but it's so what within a few days or a few weeks later, whereas all the other things that you've spoken about, the speaking, the the podcast in the books, all those sorts of things have a much longer shelf life that you can then share again and again on social media. I think that's true. And I think it's the shelf life that what matters. People tell me you're everywhere all the time. I constantly see you. You must be on social media 24 hours a day. The fact is I'm not. I believe in doing things that look as if I'm on social media all the time, but that actually I'm doing things that have a long shelf life. So, you know, being on a podcast is one of those things. Someone reading my book is one of those things. And yes, we share on social media, but even like PR in magazines, you know, I was just in Forbes again for the third time. People will read that in years to come. And so they will come into my world that way. But I'm a big believer that social media isn't your biggest thing. My email list makes me a ton more money than social media. Social media, a lot of the time can just be a vanity metric. Mm. Yeah, I think that's so important. So there's loads of things in that that have been brilliant and have given you fantastic results. Have you tried anything that's actually been a bit crap that you wish you hadn't bothered with? Yeah, loads. I did Clubhouse for a bit. Oh, (laughs) God, Clubhouse. Is that still a thing? I I don't know if it's a thing. I bet it is, and we just don't know about it. But I tried that. I tried to do a Telegram list once quite consistently to take my platform's off of Facebook and put them onto other membership platforms. But the problem is everyone's on Facebook. And so even if they hate it, they're still on there. And so they're more likely to see your stuff than going somewhere else. I'm not really on LinkedIn very much. So I think my team repost stuff that I do on Facebook and Instagram onto LinkedIn. But LinkedIn hasn't really worked for me and my audience. Do you think with LinkedIn, because I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn, that's definitely my biggest platform by far. Do you think it's that you're not really very in love with LinkedIn, therefore you you haven't done as much as you could with it? Or have you tried things on LinkedIn and, and it's just not where your audience really is? Yeah, it, it wasn't where my audience really is. I think LinkedIn is changing and it's becoming more sociable like Facebook. Well, when I was trying it two or three years ago, it was a place where people wanted corporate clients and my clients aren't corporate you know they are people often either a stay-at-home mom or you know somebody that doesn't want to go back to work they're people that want a side hustle they're people that want to make money as well as doing what they're doing and they're people that definitely want to work online and those people generally my ideal client is between the kind of 35 and 55 year age group you're on facebook mm-hmm. i think you should try LinkedIn again and see how it it goes for you because what I see on LinkedIn is that if I put a post out there and say you like it although you won't because you're not on it very much but say you liked it then all of your audience then get to see my post in your feed and I think that works in a way that you just don't get on the other platforms and the challenge I find around LinkedIn is that you then get tons of messages. It can be quite hard to keep on top of comments and, and messages and things like that. But I think if you can nail it, I do think LinkedIn's worth investing in. So maybe factor that into one of your, your 90 day sprints and see how it goes for you. So Lisa, your profile is pretty decent, right? You've got loads of followers on the platforms that you do engage on and you've got loads of, you know, a great mix of coverage on various press articles. You've just been in Forbes again, amazing. You've got the book, podcast, all sorts of things. You're you're ticking all of those boxes. But 
there can be a downside to being visible. And I know that you've had some quite unpleasant comments and, and haters, if we want to call them. How do you handle them? Easily these days, but I didn't used to. I think that any woman in particular that is talking about money, we're not used to hearing women talk about money as openly as I talk about it. I've gone from 35,000 to 15 million in six years. I talk about that. It's part of my story. Doing that is going to bring hate because it's holding a mirror up to people and their insecurities. And I totally understand it. At the beginning, when I started getting, you know, competitor hate online, I worried about it. I, I didn't like it. I was scared of it. I was like, why don't these people like me? Now I don't. And it's because I've done the inner work to learn that people have their issues. It's not even them half the time. It's their six-year-old selves running around feeling insecure. And so you can't really be very angry with somebody, you know, hurt people hurt people. And it's very difficult to be angry with somebody that's already hurt. And so actually it doesn't bother me these days. If I get a comment that's nasty or someone spreading a rumor or any of those things, I can look beneath to see why that person feels the need to do those things. And I'll often reach out and see if I can help. And do they reply? Sometimes. Sometimes I'll get an apology and I was having a really crap day. This thing has happened to me. I get it. You know, we all have those days. We never know what's going on in someone's life. But yeah, it used to really, really hurt. And in the book, I wrote a whole chapter on some of the really unethical stuff that's happened to me simply because I've been successful at what I do. It's so interesting because I just think that talking about things like money and success is actually really encouraging for people so I can't understand why anyone would behave in that way at all it makes no sense to me so I think your sort of understanding your inner work there around how they must be feeling and they're probably you know if they were feeling comfortable and confident in their own lives why the heck would they bother to to say yeah. something and I think it's that whole keyboard warrior stuff and just being unpleasant to make themselves feel better so I think that's a great way of looking at it and actually reaching out to them as well it's sort of quite funny as well and and actually it's a good reminder to them that there's just no need for that it's unnecessary it's mean and that there's a person behind it because I yes. think people often think she's rich so she doesn't feel anything which is ridiculous you know I am somebody that's diagnosed with depression and anxiety that's something that people maybe wouldn't know about me. And I think when people send hate online or send me horrible messages, they forget sometimes. It's just a person at the end of the day with kids that's going about their everyday life. Money doesn't change any of that. It's just a thing. But yeah, hopefully I remind people of that on a daily basis. Well, good. And I really love how open you are around how you're dealing with that and, and the things that you're experiencing. Because I think that's a concern that I often hear from people who are worried about putting themselves out there more, being more visible and that downside. And I think, you know, for most people that are just starting out and just becoming a bit more visible, the likelihood of them getting those mean comments, you know, it does take a while until your profile's quite big before you even start getting those. Like, can can you remember at what point it was where you were getting those comments? Yeah. In the first year of my business, I made 220,000. And on the day that I wrote on Facebook that that happened, somebody that I had actually coached with, as in I was her client, got very triggered by it and started rumors up, like started going into Facebook groups with other coaches to say that I was a bad person and that I was a show off and I had no integrity and all of these different things. And, you know, it nearly broke me. But I remember also at the time going, well, I know what I don't want to be like. And integrity then became a real core value of mine, integrity and honesty, and not competing with each other, but collaborating became a massive value. And if it wasn't for that person being that mean to me, I wouldn't have made the multi-millions that I have now. I just find that just so bizarre. And especially when you've spent money with this person. That is insane. That is just insane. But I think that actually, you know, you're saying that was the first experience where that happened. But actually, given the scale that you've grown the business to since and your audience is so much bigger now, actually, it's the same issue at the bottom of it, isn't it? It's the same issue. So, yeah, I just find that staggering. I just can't understand why anyone would do that. But there we have it. So uh, moving on from the meanies, what do you think about this challenge of 
putting yourself out there and promoting what you're doing and being very visible, but also keeping it balanced with not becoming overly self-promotional? Yeah, I don't believe in over self-promoting, mainly because when I go into a shop, they don't hide everything that they want to sell me. And I don't see why just because we're online, it should be any different. I think it's really interesting that we're told online, we have to help and give value, value, value. And only when you've given so much value, should you sell anything? Fact is when we're selling anything, we're just offering something, a solution to people's problems, which is exactly what anyone does when they sell. So why are we hiding that when somebody seeks me out? It's normally because that's when they need help with their problem. So what I'm not going to do is not sell for six months while I give so much value. I'm just going to sell straight away. So I actually don't believe very much in not self-promoting. I believe you should be selling and promoting every day. Like Tesco's. I think that's such a great way of looking at it because the reality is if they're not looking to buy or they're not looking to engage with you, then they're just going to scroll on by in any case. Whereas if you're being visible and you're doing all of the things, then the people that are interested in learning more about you and learn more about what you offer are going to then actually seek more out. So then by providing that service and filling the shelves, there's somewhere for them to go. So your world is predominantly online, but we met at an in-person event. What value do you see in in in-person networking? Yeah, I think it's getting bigger. I think that connecting, especially, you know, after everything that happened with COVID, people value connection more than they did before. And I think that I see it, if I'm doing a live to 200 people online, compared to me being on a stage or connecting with people in real life to even 50 people, my conversion rate will be higher in real life because you are a fully rounded 3D person who doesn't just talk about business. Now, online, we tend to go towards not talking about ourselves as much. In person, we talk about ourselves more. Now, what we know is that people say people buy from people. I actually disagree. I think people buy from people that they like but they don't know often that they like you because online we're just talking about what we know. We shouldn't be, but most people do. In person, we talk about what we watched last night. We talk about our kids. We talk about the things that mean that people can know if they like you or not. So if we can just bring that connection online in the same way, I think we would have great results. It's just that most people don't. And so that connection in real life is really important for most people. And you're a big fan, I think, of creating in-person events now within your business. So that seems to dovetail really well into all of the online stuff. Are you finding that they're really easy to, to sell out and to get people along and engage with? Yeah, I mean, I'm never going to like in person more than online. You know, I can do a webinar and have 13,000 people on it from across the world. In person, I'm only going to have so many people in a room. And so I'll always prefer online, but I am enjoying the in person. Just as a human, I enjoy in person connection more than being online. And so it's nice to do more of that. And when we did the book tour, I loved going to all the different places and seeing all the different people who were reading my book and having those conversations. And yeah, I I do enjoy it, but I also enjoy being online. Mm. It's good to have the mix. And I think it is deepening those relationships and giving people that you've connected with online that opportunity to meet you in real life and do all those cool things. Gosh, it is the end of our time chatting. I've loved chatting to you, Lisa, and and hearing about some of the things that are working really well for you in your business. If anyone's listening and this is the first time that they've come across you, where's the best place for them to find you? The easiest place is on Instagram, at Lisa Johnson Strategist. I'm always over there. I answer my own messages. So if you ever want to reach out and say hi, it will be me on the other end. Perfect. Well, we'll put a link to your Instagram profile in the show notes and we'll also stick a few other links there for all things Lisa so that you can take a look further. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you're serious about growing your profile, take our free profile assessment quiz to see where you're at right now and get hints and tips on how to improve your score. You'll find the link to the quiz in the show notes. If you've enjoyed the episode, it would be mint if you'd subscribe, like and leave a review. See you next Monday.